Hello and good evening. Uh, this is Manos Prilakis, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a physiology workup about imaging, coronary physiology and imaging by cardiovascular innovations. Uh, the target audience uh, is um, a cardiologist, obviously, and everyone else interested. There is CME accreditation, so everyone can go to the CVI Innovations website to get accreditation. And it is my pleasure to welcome a very distinguished panel from both the East and West Coast and the middle of the United States. We have Dr. Chaldry Alres, who is the Director of Interventional Cardiology Research at the Detroit Medical Center. Dr. Matt Price, who is the Director of the Cardiac Cath Lab in Scripps Clinic in San Diego, California. Dr. Arlon Sido, who is the Chief of Cardiology at the Long Beach VA Medical Center at Long Beach, California. And then Dr. Ivan Slovmitz, who is um, um, actually the, um, at the St. Francis Hospital, sorry for the um, mispresent there, but he's a director of imaging at St. Francis Hospital in Roslyn, New York. So again, we're delighted to have you um, all here tonight and uh, we look forward to great cases and great discussion. Similar to the other um, webinars, this is going to be a very interactive uh, presentation of cases followed by discussion. Feel free to put any comments or questions that you have through the chat function and we'll be happy to address them either online or in person. Also, we'd like to thank the supporters for this CME activity, which are Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and Philips. And then uh, um, if you would like to get CME credit, just log into this address, which we provided at the CVI website, cviinnovations.org, complete the evaluation form, and you'll receive CME. And then also we'd like to invite you also to the next webinar, which is going to be on pulmonary embolism. And this is going to happen on April 1st, 2021. And again, cvinnovations.org is where you find all the information. So without any further delay, we'll start with uh, Dr. Alris, who is going to present some interesting uh, cases of coronary physiology. So Chadi, welcome, and uh, we'll look forward to your cases. Again, thank you for uh, having me. It's gonna be an entertaining uh, and interactive session. Please feel free to ask any questions and we'll take questions from the audience as well. These are my disclosures. All right, uh, so just want to put a, a startup slide, the use of coronary physiology. So majority or all of us uh, do physiology to assess of ischemia for somebody with stable, unstable angina or uh, positive stress test or ACS for non culprit results um, or for PCI pre and post intervention to evaluate if we have completed the job and kind of completely resol resolve the ischemia from the culprit result or for cabbage planning for somebody, I will have a case about this, if there's a multi visual involved, uh, if this patient weren't to go for cabbage or multi visual PCI, and also can be used, which is questionable area for valvular heart disease evaluation, uh, but has been used recently more often, uh, especially in the uh, Lundequist absence in the market after being pulled for valve and gradient evaluation. So with that, I would like to start with the case. Uh, this is a 64, 65 year old man presented with unstable angina and resting pain. He has history of uh, hypertension, heavy smoking, and hyperlipidemia. Unfortunately, he doesn't take any medication because he just when he came to us, he was diagnosed with these problems. Giving his presentation and uh, uh, heavy smoking of two pack per day, we did a stress test that showed mid basal inferior and inferior lateral ischemia. We started medical therapy as usual, aspirin, metoprolol, MDOR, lisinopril, and atorvastatin, but he continued to have chest pain, and therefore we uh, took him to the lab. As you see, there is a, on the left side, there is an RCA shot. It's kind of diffuse, small RCA, but it's dominant, but it's diffuse disease. We were wondering if there is an ocel disease, but there was none. The, there was no dampening with the diagnostic catheter. There was no change in the pressures. However, on the left side, it's uh, becoming more prominent. You see the multiple level of uh, lesions there involving the, uh, the uh, uh, possibly left main, ossal cirque, and also the LAD. Also noted to have uh, uh, RCA, uh, sorry, uh, OM disease, uh, CTO, with left to, to left to collaterals. I have more views. So this is again more close up towards the lift system and the uh, RAL crane view, uh, again, showing the collaterals coming to the OM and again, illustrating more maybe moderate disease in the osteal or proximal cirque, as well as the lift main, but LAD has some distal disease that giving these collaterals 
but we were wondering about the mid area if there's any uh, issues. So I'd like to stop here to ask the panel, what would be your approach here? And uh, what would be the next step? Yeah, hey, great case. By the way, it's Matthew here. Um, my thoughts are, well, uh, if I remember correctly from your first slide, there's infralateral ischemia. Yeah. So that his, uh, the obstructive CAD on angiography is consistent with his stress test. So um, I would focus on his, that totally occluded circumflex. Seems like you can get anterior grade. There's probably a micro channel. Might even be functionally occluded um, given his unstable symptoms and the copious collateral. So. Um, I hear you about the distal left main and the mid LED. There's that mid LED lesion, maybe an areocranial might be nice, but I would first go after what I think is the driving issue here is a circ, and then um, extra credit, start assessing the other vessels. Great approach. Yeah, that's what I was thinking process as well. And, and then I guess another point is if you have a CTO, you know, let's say the ladies give collaterals, right? If you put a pressure wire there, you may have a false uh, positive. You may have lower uh, FFR or resting hyperemic index. And obviously, Arlo can give us more uh, his opinion on this. But the idea is you have to open the CTO first to be able to better assess the severity of the donor vessel for the collaterals as well. That's a very good point, uh, especially the setting of CTO. There's a donor vessel. Maybe it's falsely low. Um, sorry, for Matthew, for your credit, I give you a different view now just to show you the LAD and more uh, so and I guess the, the bypass question is not another oh, yeah, question get, too, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I guess. So your point is, so sorry to interrupt, Manos, is that oh, so sure. if, you're, if your LED is functionally significant, I mean, whatever, if we do an, some sort of accurate assay, assay yeah. and we find it functionally significant, does that mean this patient should go to bypass surgery? Is, was the patient diabetic? I can't recall. No. I've already it forgotten. So... Um, Personally, for me, my, my approach would be irrespective. I mean, I, I think it's great to do this, um, and I want to learn how you did this accurately. Um, but I, I still would just focus on the CERC, open that up, um, and, then, and then go from there. But I think this is a fine approach if you want to do that LED first. Sure. Yeah, if so you measure what's physiology what's in the uh, mid LED to be severely ischemic, then certainly you want to fix that uh, and determine whether, I mean, if it, even if it's giving a donor collateral, it's not going to be so bad as to create a FFR of 0.6 or 0.75. It's not going to, it's not even, it's not going to do that. It should only go down by 0.05 or at most with the collateral. And one of the advantages if the, by evaluating the LED, if that's ischemic and go after that first, it's a more straightforward lesion. And this way that's been revascularized prior to taking on the circumflex. Right. So this is, I mean, these are kind of sort of discussion point as everybody illustrated. I'm not saying that's what we have done. So would you IFR the LED and see how significant it is? Or would you, oh, is there a role for performing pullback uh, evaluate that lesion if this focal diffuse disease, which is can't change the management plan. And would you IFR the left circumflex and uh, is the left main involved? So that's all the questions we had as well, just based on the angiogram itself. Arnold, so, can I interrupt? Sorry, Arnold, you said something that I kind of, I'm not sure I got it. So you're, what was your, about, you're saying that the fact that it's feeding the collaterals to the CTO would only affect the FFR by 0 .0, 0 0.05 at most? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, given how small that collateral is, it's not like a huge uh, entire vessel. I mean, you would not expect that FFR to, you know, be so significantly changed that if you had a 0 0.60 FFR, of course, it's going to be still ischemic in the LED, even after fixing the LED at, at the CTO. If it was 0 0.65, same thing. 0 0.70, probably the same thing. 0 0.75, you know, you might you might start wondering, but it's going to be close enough to be to uh, to be uh, to thinking about it. So 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 just going is this going beyond a positive and a negative FFR? It's about the depth of ischemia, and if it's a really deep ischemia that's not explainable from that lateral wall, then uh, I think it's be worth uh, looking at and fixing the LED at the same time. Great, great points. Again, this is, uh, I'll tell you what we have done. So again, we we did try to, uh, we're gonna IFR the LED, we decided to go after it, especially in that lesion in the mid area. But I was afraid that there is a left main disease. So therefore, I wanted to normalize completely in the aorta. So what we did, we advanced the pressure wire, 
we disengage the guide completely, we flush the system and normalize in the aorta. So at least we are not completely biased or there's any issues with the uh, baseline measurements. And then we advance the wire distally to the LAD. We cross that lesion, the mid area, as you saw, it was moderate. And then again, just for the audience, we uh, ideally you should make, flush the system completely from any contrast. And in ideal situation, you should give some nitro before advancing the wire to rule out any spasm or any issues that induced by the guide. And then you flush the system and then you remove the uh, introducing leader and flush the system. Chadi, to interrupt this for teaching purposes, the level set. So you chose an IFR here because it should not be, there should not be interaction with the lesion in question and the total occlusion that's fed by collaterals. Why did you choose an IFR here? IFR because it's quicker, faster, number one, and we don't need to give any uh, adenosine. So this is our go-to first. And then when it is equivocal or it's like a, a close to normal uh, or 0 0.89, 0 0.9, usually I upgrade to FFR. Matt, Matt brings up a good question though. Is yes. IFR as affected by the collaterals as FFR? And you would think FFR is slightly more affected and that would be convincingly the case. Uh, I mean, I think as an IFR, uh, I think an IFR would be equal, could be equally affected, but it's it, uh, it, it's you know it's just a different scale essentially. I mean, it's, it's half the change that you might expect. In this case, you're you're showing an IFR that's pretty impressively ischemic, uh, and so you would expect that lesion or the collective value of the entire LAD to be still positive even after Correct. fixing that CTO. Correct. So that's what we have now. We have an IFR. A uh, couple of measurements was. 0.7, 0 0.77, 0 0.80, so in that range. And it was all uh, focal, it was focal step up at the middle AD lesion where you had a step up on the on the IFR? Yeah, exactly. very good question now, Manos. I mean, that's what we asked earlier to do pullback to confirm that a diffuse disease or is this something focal? So that's our pullback. Again, I'm showing here two arrows. One arrow is an M in red showing the lesion, I think, of interest. And then I am showing the blue line is where is, this is where I stop the pressure wire pulling. And this is our reading. It's 0 0.80 in that area. And you see it's, any comments about this line before I make my comments? Um, I think, you know, it shows relatively diffuse disease with almost three, uh, pull, you know, uh, three step ups uh, and gradual changes in between. And, and we just had a talk from Lance Gould who found that really 75% of the time there is actually more diffuse disease. And, and despite us in interventional cardiology always hoping for focal disease that we can easily treat, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, the reality of coronary disease is it is more diffuse and that medical therapy sometimes works better or cabbage works better. It's kind of scary to us. Uh, we had a quick question, uh, data of, doing an FFR in patients with an IFR that's positive at 0.89, I accidentally answered it, but uh, essentially there is no data to suggest that you have to do an FFR after an IFR that's already positive. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, no one studied that great. so far. That's great. So look, I'm going to throw out some questions here. So, I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw an IFR of 0.77, all right? So that's, it's pretty low, all right? Um, I just can't, I know there's, we, I just can't believe that the circumflex is not contributing substantially to this IFR for all of our theorizing and so forth. I'm really curious, Chadi, what you decided to do um, um, in this, because I have my own thoughts, but I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you um, I mean, this is a great that's case. Why I'm, that's why I'm presenting the case. Um, well, yeah. I've, had some, I've, had, I've had a late coffee, so I'm talking a lot, um, uh, but Chadi, I, I think this is a great case. I'm really excited um, to see what, what you did, okay? No, please, I mean, this is, this is why I would Think this case specifically number one to go over basics but that's what Manos wants so something like intellectual and then what you what is a patient management at the end and provocative too I, I don't know if uh, maybe the whole pullback's not uh, on this screen capture but it looks like also there might be some uh, significant drift which could be contributing to that low value well that's a very good point uh, Ivan we did uh, we I re confirmed that this is, uh, by the way, this is Philips, uh, with this is uh, uh, Omni 3 wire. So this is, again, we perform it, we, which is we just recently got it in the lab. We have been using Parada for a while. So uh, we come again, we advanced the wire again. I repeated multiple times, reflushed, re-normalized, 
and continue to be in that range. I don't have a better... No, no I think, I think sorry, what he's saying is, if you look at the, maybe you don't have the full pullback here, because if you look at the edge of the pullback, you're at 0.9 something. So you're not all the way back to one. So I think I think part of it, the Philips doesn't give you the whole thing compressed. I think probably that's what we're seeing here. Right. Yeah, I'm but it went back to one, right? I think yeah. that's what Ivan is referring to. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So it should be coming to one. Uh, yeah, I agree. yeah. You got us all in agony. All right, so just wanna illustrate this to the audience. Uh, this is not the case itself, but just to show the difference between a diffuse disease, which is what we have here, compared to a focal problem. I don't know if the panel uh, agree, but this is more focal. This is, I think, what Arnold was alluding to. This is what I want to see on a pullback. I want to see a focal lesion where I can guide it with imaging and then go after it. I think that's what uh, Arnold is alluding to. Uh, but this is not the case here. This is a different case. We just uh, wanted to show the differences between these two. Any comments? That's great. Now let's let's go quick, quick, quick. We kind of out of time, so if you don't mind, let's uh, sure. see what happens. So we can have the rest of the so, again, that's a pullback, and then here we were wondering: is there a left main involved? Remember, oh. you ground. So I did an I the left main to confirm that because remember I stopped the 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 pressure wire just before the left main, and then I said, but I was wondering: is this a left main, and is this contributing because of the CTO? Is this a pressure issue, and then I said, let's use guy, uh, imaging to confirm the left main disease. Uh, is it a, uh, jeopardized or not? That's the IVIS. I mean, we have an IVIS expert. Maybe I'm not drawing the perfect lining here, but anyway, in that range, that was one of the spots that in the mid shaft or mid to distal shaft of the left main. And I must say I'm that, a little in shock here, but <laughs> that was a good guess. <laughs> this is the same patient, you're sure. Okay. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. And that's, uh, that's why good. I think it was intriguing to, to present. To yes. present. I don't want to confuse the audience, but they just make sure that these two tools are complementary to each other more than they are kind of black and white. So again, we heard, took the patient off, heart team approach, Cabbage for his PCI, but eventually we went for a cabbage, giving the involvement and the age of the patient, as well as his poor compliance history. So, for the sake of time, I don't want. I have another case, quick case, Matthew. So, you'd like me to present it? Otherwise, yeah, I can pause. Yeah, I think yeah, we should move. Yeah, we should move on to, uh, to to Matthew next. But again, that was a great case. I think lots of learning there. That you know, before you decide on the revascularization strategy, right? You want to get a good, accurate assessment of the anatomy. And yes. here, I must agree, I, I didn't really see it. I thought the main was perfectly fine. Even the lady I thought it was fine. So I was completely surprised from this. <laughs> and I, I think the other, <laughs> other uh, all the panel was similarly. But again, yeah, if you're going to show us again that picture, so I mean, that left main to me doesn't look too bad. And that's again, oh. the limitations of angiography, right? Absolutely, yeah. And I'm 100%, I mean, this is the same case. And I was, the only reason I did IVAS here is because of the CTO and maybe I'm having some issues with the, proper physiology with the CTO. Wonderful. Again, thank you very much, Sally. That was a great case. And again, without further delay, we'll move on to again, Dr. Matthew Price from Scripps Clinic. Needs no introduction. He'll show some cases switching to imaging now, specifically for OCT for which he spearheaded the development. Actually, remember his cases from like the 10 years ago, some amazing case <laughs> of stent deformation. So I cannot imagine what he's got to show us today. I have a really straightforward case to show you guys, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you see my slides? Perfect. Slides are up? Yeah, good. Perfect, thank you. My disclosures. So this brings up a lot of questions beyond even imaging, which I, I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on. Um, okay, let me go back. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button here. Ah. Okay, so this is a 58-year-old male who presents with accelerating angina, which is occurring now intermittently at rest, who has an abnormal troponin 1.040. You see the normal at my hospital. His ECG shows ST depressions in the anterior precordium. He has a history of type two diabetes. He also has NAS cirrhosis with a prior hepatic encephalopathy. And fascinatingly, just the day before he underwent a routine um, screening endoscopy where they found esophageal varices that they ligated. You see the beautiful endoscopy on your lower right there. 
So here's his laboratory data. Is he's not that anemic? His hemoglobin is ten point eight. His platelet count is only fifty three thousand. His synthetic function is okay. He's COVID negative. We're in the middle of the COVID era, so this was not an issue. Um, and you see his echo shows a decent LV function and no wall motion abnormalities. So we brought him to the cath lab or right radial. Um, and this is the angiogram. So um, I'll show you some more better pictures in a moment. Suffice it to say, he has a small and non-dominant right coronary artery. I guess maybe we'll focus on the right side of the screen first. So clearly a dominant left circumflex. You see this large bifurcating up to his marginal with diffuse calcified disease also involving some of those submarginals, if that's a word, I just made that up, submarginals, um, branching marginals. If you look at the cranial shot here of the LED, especially if I freeze it before um, any contrast comes in there, you see heavy calcification here. I think there might be a prior stent in there actually as well. You also have um, disease of this very large diagonal and you have diffuse distal LED disease. All right, so you've got a guy, he's 58. Liver disease, platelet count of 35,000, positive troponin. So I'm sorry, uh, your surgeons are thrilled, right? <laughs> this angiogram looks uh, a lot I worse than Johnny's. Them, the surgeons would have been thrilled, would not been thrilled. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so the question is, do you, do you treat this patient medically? What If you're going to open something, what are you going to open? You know, he, he has varices that were just banded yesterday. His platelet count is 53. What's going to be your dual antiplatelet therapy plan? What's going to be your stent plan? How are you going to treat this highly calcified lesion? What are you going to do about that bifurcation? That diagonal is probably important to this guy because he has no apical LED, right? How far down do you stent? Do you do, you do the circ first and then the LED? I That's can speak for myself. I, I, I'm going to walk away from this one <laughs> any day. Uh, just, just walk away and stay out of trouble. Maybe I'll drop a pressure wear just to red. see how bad it is. And one more time, Chatty. Maybe I'll pressure, uh, I will interrogate the circ more. The LAD definitely diffuse disease. The ostal bag is definitely tight. But the circumflex, maybe it's my screen, but I'm not seeing a good focal lesion there. I'll, I'll show you more. It diffused past the ongoing circuits bad. All right, what is this? What is my next slide? Okay. 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 So here we go. Here's some better shots. Um, oh, okay. Because I'm not a man as as, as um, brave as Arnold and I put up a guide. Okay. So here's, I, 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 saw, I sized up to a seven French slender from my six French sheath in the right radial artery. I have a seven French backup guide. You see very nicely now the LED and diagonal and you see that distal circumflex. What's his EF? 72%. He has intermittent chest pain at rest with dynamic SD depressions anteriorly. So I guess, oh, sorry, go ahead, even. Sorry. No, just the marginals are great targets, but the LAD, there's no good distal target, which is definitely gonna be a concern and help push you, I think, a little bit more towards PCI. But, but I think here, the question is, what's the culprit, right? So yeah. we need to find a way to know the culprit. So you can either do, I guess, you know, hint, hint, you're doing the OCT talk. So either do OCT and look for thrombus, the other way to go for this would be to actually take him off the table if he's not having active chest pain, do a cardiac MRI and actually see what actually is the area that's being affected and then go target it for that particular area. But I, I know I, I suspect that uh, uh, Matthew will show us about uh, some imaging, right? And find the culprit yeah, lesion. Yeah. And what I did, Manus, I'm going to talk about imaging, but I also wanted sort of a practical case um, um, that sort of, you know, I'm going to show about how I use imaging to actually revascularize this patient. My thoughts were um, my, my thoughts were that the culprit um, in terms of his, the most bang for my buck was this LED diagonal bifurcation in the proximal LED. Although the apical LED is ratty, there's also, there's some serious septals there that are being fed. Um, and so my thought was to first do the LED diagonal and then um, see how he does and bring it back for the circumflex. And then a question that comes to the chat, I mean, how about antiplatelets, aspirin, plavix, I guess, and see how he does? What were your thoughts about, uh, about that with the, with the viruses? Well, that's very good. And what stents are you going to use, right? So um, so we'll get to that, okay? That's these okay. Questions.
All right, so here's my approach. So um, two wires down, the, these are just workhorse wires down the LED and diagonal. Um, I pre-dilate the 2.0 cut with, with a 2.0 to the diagonal pretty conservatively. Then I'm taking a 2.25 NC working that LED. And, and you see here, actually, it doesn't show quite so well, but no matter what, you've got 20 atmospheres, this LED is not expanding, okay? And it was too tight for me to put down an OCT to begin with, just so you know. So I, you know, there was no flow around my OCT, Catherine, I couldn't deliver it. So what are your thoughts now? I have no, 20225. I like Arnold's plan <laughs> more and more. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is totally predictable. <laughs> All right, but you know what? So, okay, so next up, so this is, so this is off label. Okay, we now have coronary IVL. Okay, Chocolate, but, yeah. Yeah. This was about a, six weeks ago or maybe eight weeks ago. So um, it was a straight shot. So um, I actually was able to deliver a two, five, and again, I can't get an OCT down this thing. Okay, so I can't, I would normally image before I shockwave, but there was clearly horrific calcification just by fluoroscopy. I can't get anything down, but I was actually, um, I might say I couldn't get an OCT down, down. I couldn't get any contrast around my catheter. Um, so I went with a 2.5 by 40. There's a peripheral IVL catheter. Do not try this at home. We now have coronary IVL. And I went with a 2.5. You want to you um, size one to one for your reference vessel diameter. Um, but also the 2.5 is, is just easier to get down um, because this is a big, long, stiff balloon. It's the smallest one anyway. Huh? Say that again? It's the smallest one. It's a... Uh... Smallest yes. peripheral balloon, yeah. Yes, a peripheral balloon. Yes, exactly. It's the, um, with, uh, See, I'm shocked you could deliver it down there. I mean, the yeah. these are bulky balloons, I, I, so it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and also, I have, I, look, the 2.5 balloon, 7 French guide, I'm able to um, um, have a, have a um, diagonal wire still in there to protect it, right? And so, look, with Shockwave, I'm not here to talk about Shockwave. Sort of some impressive technology you see after a couple of pulses how there's at, at four atmospheres you have full expansion of your shockwave balloon so now i oct okay so let's talk about oct guided um pci uh hat tip to um dr shoffman's um, um um relative who has helped lead, leading the way forward for um precision pci so um First, what we want to do, and Abbott's come up with a, a good acronym so you can remember everything, is MLD Max. So MLD is pre-PCI, Max is post-PCI, MLD stands for morphology, lesion length, or stent length, and stent diameter. So let's walk first. I'm going to press play here. There's some very interesting things here. So first, that's going to be my normal vessel there, and I'm actually just going to walk this through so it's, it's easier. So here, so this is my, this is integrated OCT, so you see this white hash mark here. That's what, this is the CT or tomographic cut here. This is the long axis view. And I thought this would be my most normal area to land. You can see by, from the lumen profile here as well, this is the biggest area downstream. As we move proximally, you'll, be, you'll see the results of the, the, the IVL momentarily because I started right about here. So right no, about no, here, no. you begin to see, you see these, these fissures or fractures, longitudinal fractures due to the lithotripsy energy. And right there, for example, here, here, and here. So what's happening with intravascular lithotripsy is you're cracking in situ the, the calcium. And when you're gonna implant your stent, that's gonna shift those, pla those, those, those tectonic plates aside to allow for full stent expansion. So I'm pulling back more and more here. There's just a ton of calcium in here, guys. You can appreciate these, the circumferential calcium, which has now been broken at four atmospheres of shockwave. Look at this here. So this is circumferential calcification, very thick. I'm just offhand here. It's more than one millimeter thick all the way around. It's also medial deep calcification as well. All the way back. Are very good fractures there, yeah. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. In fact, there is no, and this is a different case, there is no prior stent. And then I got to go all the way to the ostium. This is the ostium of the LED right here. There's plaque there. So how, so how am I going to decide how to do this? So um, first, morphology-wise, I usually would do it based on an OCT, but we couldn't do it. 
Here we've addressed, we've modified the plaque. We have good fracture throughout. So I'm happy, with, I don't need any more plaque modification. In terms of the stent length, we have a 64 millimeter long lesion. So we have to figure out how, what stent length to give. I also don't wanna double overlap the diagonal. So I'm gonna take this, I'll probably measure out and I'm sort of eyeballing here, just live on the screen here. And I say right about here, maybe about a, a 30 millimeter stent will get me to just distal to that diagonal. So I don't overlap it. And then I can add a 38 millimeter stent to get back to the ostium of the LED. Finally, you want the size of your stent. What you're going to do is take the, the distal and proximal reference vessels, measure the EEL to EEL distance if you can, take the mean of that, go down one size uh, for your stent size, or if you can't get the EEL to EEL distance, you're gonna go up one size. And you have to determine your post dilatation strategy. So the next slide shows all this. So this is just, again, some examples of these longitudinal fractures by intravascular lithotripsy. All right, so as I mentioned, the lesion length was 64 millimeters. So I had decided to take a 34 and a 38 stent. You gotta add a little bit for your overlap, say five millimeters. So that came out to be about 70, 72. My distal reference, you look here, I, don't, I couldn't get it to actually print out the numbers, I apologize, but the mean EEL to EEL distance was 3.1. Pretty big, I'm surprised, right? So, um, but go by what your OCT tells you. So I'm gonna choose a three millimeter stent for my distal stent. The proximal difference has, a, the, the proximal reference, there's no EEL I can see because of, diff, of diffuse placking, concentric placking. I get a ML, um, mean luminal diameter of 2.67. So I'll probably post dilate my, I'll take that three, uh, another three O stent proximally and post dilate to about 325 or so. But the person back there, the distal, distal lumen was two and a quarter, basically. So I think without the OCT, most people would be going with two and a quarter stent. Right. I'm going to bring a much bigger stent than exactly, Evan. And this is what I found. Generally, bigger, longer stents when you use OCT with our MLD Max algorithm. And look at this is impressive. Look at the first of my first stent. And look at that expansion, right? After that 225 balloon didn't do anything. Um, we didn't really talk about our our di our. our Bifurcation approach, and we have a lot to talk about. This could be a bunch of different presentations. I chose to do a culotte. I like the culotte, um, and this allowed me to maintain both both um, wires down the vessel. I chose. I, we can talk about what to do for stent. I not to prefer one DS over the other. We've got great DS now. Um, I chose the Onyx stent. I, I've been involved in the um, abbreviated DAP trials with Onyx with Onyx one and the um, Onyx One Clear in the United States which showed acceptable safety and efficacy of one month DAPT after Onyx in all comer lesions and high bleeding risk patients. This patient's clearly at high bleeding risk. So I, I did a, um, a 3.0 by 34, like I mentioned. I, I, I didn't actually image the diagonal just out of time and preserve contrast. I put a 225 by 38 in that to set up my culotte. I, um, the OCT also, Evan, as, as you were noting about the size, is very good for these bifurcations to know how big of a balloon you need to pot with. There's a lot of disease there, so I just chose a 3.0 that seemed to be the right size based on the OCT. I do my kissing to rewire into the LED. I place my 3.0 by 38 stent. I'm, I'm here in the cranial, excuse me, the spider view because I want to land this just at the ostium. And then I did a kiss with non-compliant balloons after I rewired. Again, using probably that was a 3.0 NC in the, in the LED and a 2.25 NC or even a 2.5 NC in the diagonal. So this is my post stenting of the LED uh, OCT. And following the MLD max algorithm for post stent, we use max. So M stands for are there medial dissections proximally or distally that you need to treat. A for stent apposition, X for stent expansion. And I'm, oh, this is, a, this is a, I'll play this first and then we'll talk about what can be found. What's really nice to see the software, the stent rendering is very pretty. Um, pretty impressive actually, um, for the most part, um, of a result we got. I was happy with where I landed our stent. I'm a little bit, um, what, my conclusions from this, first of all, is are there medial dissections? So first distally, you know, I probably could have landed a millimeter or two more distally, 
Evan, you agree there? I think that you can see that's probably actually for my shockwave balloon right here. Um, but it wasn't a deep medial dissection. It's um, not more than five millimeters in length. It's not more than one quadrant. So I left that alone. Yeah, that'll heal on its own. Right. So so no no major medial dissection. Is the apposition of the stent okay? Um, it was, except for very proximally. I am if you're right about here. I'm hanging it out in the breeze, aren't I? Right here. Actually, I landed my stent pretty well, but it's just, it's this is you don't go crazy over malopposition because actually malopposition has not been associated strongly with adverse events. But something like this, I think you really need to take care of. If you ever have to go back in, then your drug's not going to get to the lumen of the vessel. So I need to post dilate this. And also, if you look at here, I used um, when you, there's two ways you can do stent expansion out, uh, calculations automatically automated is um, the tapered way and the standard way. Here I use the tapered version because it's such a long stent and also we have a big bifurcation. So either way, use either ex expansion algorithm and there was under expansion proximally right about here um, where, the, where there's a lot of calcium. So it could be improved. I have 71% expansion. You really want it more than 80, preferably more than 90. So I just took a 3.5 um, NC balloon. You can see here, I actually measured it. It was about three, five, um, the luminal area, excuse me, luminal diameter. So Matt, I bang it out to three, five. Excuse Matt, me. A number, Matt, a number of people are asking uh, with disbelief that you would only give this person one month of DAPT, uh, despite yeah. the bifurcation and long stents. I mean, is this one month, uh, is it applicable to this type of, oh, even yeah, all sure. comers? Yeah. The patients we did in this trial were all comers with whole, really bad disease. I, I'm, and also, um, we, I'm comfortable in this patient with one month DAPT, but well, let me just continue there. We'll talk more about that ice because I have a, the circ to do really quickly. We don't have much time. Monos is going to be pushing me off the stage. Look at my final result of this LED diagonal. I mean, um, I thought I was I was proud of myself. Although this still LED, uh, you know, is is we're not going to make that better. So um, really quickly, so I discharged my DAPT, but um, I had to still do the circ. All right, so I brought him back three weeks later for the circ. He's had no bleeding events in the interval. Uh, right radial, seven front slender again. Really briefly, now I, I go straight with OCT from the beginning. Another high, actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. I pre-dilated with a 225 because it was so badly diseased. But I actually have very nice plaque modification with this 225 NC balloon. You see the fracture of the, of the plaque and the calcium there. Um, and so here, now I have 51 millimeter lesion. Uh, my, my distal media to media area is about 2.36. So I'm gonna take a 225 stent. Approximately, it's about the media, I, I, there's no EEL I can see. It's about 3.5 uh, mean luminal diameter. So I'm gonna post dilate with um, a 3.5 stent, uh, balloon. So I took a 225 and a 3.0 stents and I was gonna aggressively expand this 3.0 at high pressure, again, onyx. So here's my first stent going in. You see the balloon expansion looks good. Here's my second stent. I, it was a really quite torturous actually. So I have my mother and daughter catheter there, my guide extension, good expansion of this 3030. And I went really high pressure with that. So I'd um, pose proximally. And here's my final OCT or what I thought was my final OCT. It looks really good by the angiogram, doesn't it? But um, if you remember, MLD max, medial dissection, apposition, expansion. This is my, my markers right now, my distal stent edge. And look at this. I have a pretty significant medial dissection. So here you can see my arrow, I hope. We have a dissection all the way, yep. to all the way around more than 90, more than 180 degrees of the vessel. So this needs to be taken care of, particularly distal dissections, which can inhibit outflow. And looking back, I actually didn't start my OCT distal enough. I landed in plaque. I did not treat the normal vessel. So that was, um, I, I learned my lesson here. So I need to put another st stent distally. I would say we have fantastic expansion. This is the standard algorithm uh, for the uh, automated expansion calculation. 97% expansion distally, 91% expansion proximally. And these areas of malapposition here in the red are just where this where the vessel was aneurysmal. So I'm not gonna treat those. 
So I go ahead and actually I put a 2026 balloon uh, stent distally. That went pretty high pressure here and post dilated it. And you see my final results, quite nice. So I think that's it for me. Let's see here, do I, oh, I have a conclusion slide. So yeah, I would, I would treat this patient with, I would be comfortable. I mean, if the patient gets out 30 days, four, four to six weeks on aspirin plavix without a bleeding event, without a thrombotic event, this is the kind of patient where we know they have at least a 4% rate of major bleeding on aspirin and Plavix. So I would be comfortable stopping one of those agents. I'd probably stop the Plavix, continue him on a baby aspirin with a PPI. But I wanted to show, um, go ahead. You know, I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, I think Mark again, great, great point. I think the other point here is because you did such a good job with imaging, and well, that's right. optimized. That makes you a little more comfortable once you stop the plavix that you know hopefully they'll do okay because you don't have again under expansion and dissections and treated and all that stuff so that exactly. was excellent key. so that's my second bullet point here was part of the reason i showed this was that i think imaging is particularly useful in cases where abbreviated depth is being considered so you know that you get the, the best result there's no under expansion here there's no distal dissections um we're, we're in good shape and i also want to show you people you know oct can be used in the most complex of situations. And I think it's actually most useful in those situations. And finally, I, I think we've figured this out. An easy algorithm to remember is MLD max, morphology, stent length and diameter, pre-procedure, pre-stent, post-stent, look for medial dissections, stent apposition and stent expansion. Manos, I talked fast, Manos. thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was again, phenomenal case. I uh, really appreciate it. A lot of learning points there and an outstanding result. So we'll next move uh, to Dr. Arnold Sito again, who is again, one of the foremost experts on physiology, who is gonna tell us how to do this properly because there's many times that I personally have been burned with this. So I'm eager to hear his tips and tricks for preventing any problems and interpreting the numbers correct. So Arnold, thanks again for being here tonight. Yeah, thanks. It's hard to follow Matt, Matt's case. It's great to show the future of physiology. Many of us would look walk away from that case saying it's impossible, and you just shown us what the future is with Shockwave, and we're all looking forward to using Shockwave uh, as soon as we can get it in our labs. So uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just go over some tips and tricks for avoiding pitfalls with coronary physiology. It's going to be a little more didactic, but it's based on some cases, and uh, those are my disclosures. Uh, we all think we know how to measure FFR or IFR. The common steps include heparin and nitroglycerin, you, just as Chatty mentioned, you flush with normal saline, uh, the Tory burst has to be closed, the needle introducer has to be out, and the sensor ideally should be positioned right outside the guide, outside the coronary. As Chatty rightfully said, you know, it was very important that he didn't equalize in the left main, otherwise he would have missed that left main lesion. The guide should ideally be disengaged and should always check for drift if possible. So this is what happens if you have uh, a needle introducer in, obviously you will lose pressure loss and the aortic pressure will be lower than your wire pressure. This cannot be physiologic, so obviously take out your needle introducer, tighten up your TUIs. If you have uh, blood or contrast left in the guide, it'll actually dampen your aortic waveform. And once again, your aortic mean pressure will be lower than your wire pressure, which is not physiologic. The waveform will also be damped. So clear out the blood, clear out the contrast in your guide. This is actually pretty important uh, for our assist catheter and uh, assist injectors, actually, the power injectors. Ideally, might be cleared of saline. Uh, but even then, the uh, waveforms are sometimes different because the tubing is different than your normal catheter. So just be aware of that. One thing that people aren't often aware of is that the machines, the FFR machines, St. Jude and uh, Phillips, they both come with a uh, baseline starting point of being, defaulting to a one beat average. And this makes your FFR uh, really jump around with every beat, every PVC. So every FFR study has uh, used a three to five beat average. So if you change your FFR measurement uh, period to at least a three beat average, then you'll reduce the amount of beat to beat variability. So this is this is a good example right here on one on one set of four beats, your FFR measurement could vary from anywhere from 0.68 to 0.75, but the, uh, the, the uh, average of 0.71 will smooth it out. This is actually a little bit of an issue when you're doing pullbacks, because pullbacks uh, actually are better if they're beat to beat, because you'll have a fast, you, you don't have to lose, the, lose that beat to beat variability. Uh, so, you know, IFR pullbacks tend to be a little bit better than FFR pullbacks uh, traditionally. 
Uh, we should always disengage the guides. The guides can cause damping as shown here on the left side. When you disengage the guide, you actually recover your dichrotic notch and you'll have the full diastolic difference of the FFR versus the wire, uh, uh, wire pressure. So this is a fairly obvious case of guide dampening. You should be able to see this or ventricularization even uh, without uh, the, the comparator of the guide. But often the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the damping is not as easily evident. So this is uh, two, uh, measure, two measurements, uh, when, one with and without the guide uh, disengaged. And you see that the FFR decreases once you've disengaged the guide as marked in the location here. And you look at these pressure waveforms, there's no signs of any gross damping. You still have a dichrotic notch, you still have a de descending waveform. And you're looking closer, you really can't tell the difference between the guide being disengaged or, or engaged. So that's a good default wherever you can without losing guide position or with, when, if it's easy to uh, disengage the guide, then you should do so because you might actually have a significant difference here being 0.76 versus 0.83. Monos had a great uh, uh, study on this where you actually did uh, side hole guides or engaged side hole guides or disengaged non side hole guides. And consistently, the lowest FFR was taken when you disengaged the guide. And so routinely, you could uh, actually, um, you know, reduce the FFR further by about, uh, you know, 0 0.0, 0.03, 0.04 with the uh, disengagement of the guide. So if if you're ever something, if you're ever close, uh, or even if you're not that close, then and you want an accurate FFR or IFR, you should disengage the guide. So even experts get this type of thing wrong. Uh, the contrast study is done in European expert centers for physiology, and 5% of patients uh, of the measurements in this uh, uh, study had guide dampening. Uh, even worse, 17% of, of the measurements had signal drift. So these annoyances uh, can frequently make your FR measurements uh, inaccurate and give you, uh, you know, inconsistent results that you know, lead you to not have confidence in the result. So wherever possible, disengage the guide. Don't use a small guide or even diagnostic catheters. Uh, Ian Gilchrist mentioned someone using a four French diagnostic catheter and a wire. We don't recommend that. In terms of accuracy of measurement, uh, you know, try not to do that. Uh, drift is a real annoyance. Um, the piezoelectric uh, pressure wires of, uh, of Fafilis and Abbott traditionally can uh, have temperature shifts, uh, can cause it to cause drift. Uh, and uh, it, Blood and saline remnants can also uh, break down the components on the connector. Air bubbles can also cause a problem. And so you can only detect this when you pulled it back after the lesion is measured. And most people don't end up doing this because you're working on the same wire. Uh, you don't want to reconnect it and pull it back and then re-advance it. So this is a real challenge for physiology. Uh, it tends to be less of an issue if you measure quickly and, and come back quickly. It's usually an issue if the longer the, the wires in the vessel. But drift, when it happens, is very serious. Even low levels of drift, two, plus or minus two millimeters of mercury, can result up to 33% of measurements being misclassified. Uh, so that's really a concern. Uh, something that is still being taught uh, inaccurately is that we look, wait for the, uh, the so-called stable hyperemic period. Uh, and so, you know, I pose this question to many audiences and I ask, you know, when's the right time to measure the FFR? Is it here on uh, choice A, where uh, it's 0.68, which is the biggest difference? Or is it 0.85, where there's actual stable hyperemia, where the pressures have equalized? And so obviously, these are very different answers. One, is, one tells you to fix the lesion, the other one tells you not. So uh, the, most, most of the automated machines can only record the lowest FFR, and they'll take that as the F, uh, FFR, the lowest PDPA during hyperemia. Uh, but the original uh, description said you should wait for stable hyperemia because only then could you have resistance that's constant and minimal. Uh, so the concept was that adenosine would cause minimal resistance and it would be sustainable. And uh, that, that could be the most, uh, that's when the equations work out best is the, is the answer. Uh, and then another interpretation is to take the PDPA ratio at the lowest PD, so 0.76 in this example, where the PD is the lowest at the first time. And that's something in between these two answers. And uh, the studies have been done on this, and they found that the stable FFR is often 0.03 to 0.07 higher than the peak uh, or lowest FFR. And this is because you have some drop in the aortic pressure uh, after uh, hyperemia has been induced. So often, you, I think about it this as like, well, the, the patient's essentially trying to fight you. You, you, you know, the patient's microvasculature is basically you're giving it a fire hose. And naturally, through either uh, structural changes uh, or, you know, um, uh, you know, other non-adenosine mechanisms, you're going you're gonna to have some compensation. And so that compensation is kicking in and you get a stable, hyper, uh, stable FFR, which is higher than your, your, your lowest FFR. 
Even worse, if you give continued IV adenosine, you'll, you get, many people have seen this, after 30 seconds, you get cyclical hyperemia. And so if you keep on running it, eventually uh, half the time you will actually have hyperemia totally be abolished and not even work uh, despite continued IV adenosine. And this was confirmed in this uh, flow wire measurement. Even though you're continuing to run the IV adenosine, there's actually no hyperemic effect after five minutes. And then once again, it cycles again. And so why does this occur? It's, we th you know, I think it's maybe adenosine exhaustion. Uh, it could be compensatory mechanisms, but it's actually fairly consistent in the same person that it happens uh, repeatedly and is very annoying. This is the, uh, the, the confirmation of our study, which uh, you know, Niles Johnson did, and he took uh, 290 paired tracings from the Verify study, and he found that only 57% of the time could you get a classic sustained hyperemia, and 40% of the time you'd get this very unstable or humped pattern. And so um, stable hyperemia could only be performed, could be only achieved in 57% of cases. And even on the same patient, uh, one time it might be uh, stable and other times it might be humped and other times it'll switch off across the two pair tracing. So the only thing that was really consistent was taking the lowest FFR. So the authors here said, including Nico Piles and Bernard de Bruin said, within reason, always take the minimum FFR value. So, uh, you know, basically abandoning the concept of stable hyperemia and something that we should probably just forget about. So the answer here, take the lowest FFR of 0.68 in this example. So if you're not using the stable hyperemic phase, then why do we even bother with IV adenosine? It takes longer, it causes more symptoms of bronchospasm, it takes you know, three minutes, it's also maybe more susceptible to caffeine. Uh, whereas in contrast, if you just give an intracoronary dose of 200 for the left or 100 to the right, you could achieve as much uh, or more hyperemia than with intravenous adenosine. So it's faster, easier, why not? Uh, well, the reason we didn't do it because it's, it wasn't as well standardized, but I think we should go back to IC adenosine. Here's a couple of examples. This patient has a moderate uh, distal, L, uh, distal RCA. You give IV adenosine for 140 microns per kilo, the standard dose, it doesn't do anything to the FFR. Uh, contrast FFR, though, tells you that the FFR is actually, contrast FFR is 0.93, so you know that you can in, uh, introduce hyperemia with contrast, so you know something's wrong here. Well, it turns out when you give intracoronary adenosine 120 micrograms, the FFR is 0.89. And then the reason is the caffeine level is 3.2 mics per milliliters. And he was a regular two to three cup drinker of coffee. And the last cup was in the morning of cath. And so we know that IV, uh, caffeine can inhibit IV adenosine. It turns out that it can't inhibit as well the IC adenosine. So if you're not routinely telling people to hold coffee like you do for nuclear stress tests, then maybe the IC adenosine could actually help uh, overcome even uh, caffeine. Arnold. Yes, sir. Matthew here. Caffeine yes. levels. Do you, do you get them routinely? Should I be scared to test myself in the morning uh, <laughs> or right now, for example? Um, tell me about that. I, I, should, I be, should we get them before, for our patients and we'll know what to do? Great, great answer. You know, I'm, I just brought it to my lab and I'm going to do a quick, you know, survey when people aren't told what to do, how many people are going to have measurable caffeine levels as a quality control. And there's going to be high. I can guarantee that the amount of caffeine in our, in our population is pretty high. And the question is, when does it affect things? Well, it doesn't take much. Um, you know, one cup at midnight the night before, uh, one cup within 24 hours, your level is somewhere between one and two. And Roughly, the study suggests around two is when you might start seeing some inhibition. You may not see complete inhibition, as you saw in this past case, uh, where they had a cup of coffee that morning, but uh, you were seeing, you're going to see some inhibition. So you why bother with all that? You might as well give intracoronary adenosine. No, but you check every patient with a caffeine level? No. But whenever I see this phenomenon, which, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but I don't do a whole lot of uh, IV adenosine either. It's, this, these are all parts of research studies because I've, I've switched, I've moved on almost completely to intracoronary adenosine because I am just not patient enough for IV adenosine anymore. Uh, here's another example, which the guy was not on caffeine. He, he just has end-stage real disease, and he has LVH, some microvascular dysfunction, and we give like five minutes of IV adenosine. I've had some cases where you, it takes five or seven minutes for a dialysis patient to actually uh, mount enough of adenosine response. I can't tell why. Maybe they're adenosine resistant. Maybe they have high flow states. I still don't know why uh, dialysis patients seem to have more problems with uh, IV adenosine. Contrast FFR, of course, confirms that there's still some hyperemia to be had, so I had to give 
intracoronary adenosine and got a better response for hyperemia. And then I could, the other benefit of IC adenosine is you can give more and I can give more adenosine and truly get a hyperemic response of 180 micrograms. This is in a right, normally it's 100. So this is already twice the dose of usual. So I can overcome uh, adenosine resistance no matter how bad it is. So just to summarize, coronary physiology recordings need to be done right. Even the experts get it wrong sometimes. Take the lowest beat uh, of three to beat, three to beat value as uh, the FFR, check for drift, and consider IC adenosine over intravenous. And then meticulous technique gives confidence in the measurement, and then you'll feel better about the result. Thank you. Harold, quick question before event lines. Uh, can you discuss the best practice for contrast FFR? Yeah, we're working on that still in the acceleration study from uh, from Raj Swaminathan. You know, you inject eight cc's of contrast according to the contrast study. Uh, it doesn't matter what contrast, most of them give uh, 50 to 80% hyperemia compared with adenosine. And I was trying to talk them into, in the protocol, flushing afterwards to get a more pressure, accurate pressure measurement. I, I'm able to flush afterwards with saline and it gives me a cleaner pressure, pressure measurement, but you really have to turn on the recording fairly quickly because the contrast uh, hyperemia lasts for 20 seconds at most, 15 usually. So um, if you can flush it quickly, that'd be great. If you can disengage the guide quickly, that'd be great. But because contrast FR requires that you, ideally you, you, your, your guide has to be in the coronary initially, you're talking about doing a lot in that 15 seconds. You're disengaging the guide, flushing to get a true accurate measurement. And uh, But yeah, I think it's a little more complicated. Arnold, I'm going to be a little bit blasphemous here, okay? And I tell this to my fellows, because I my fellows are just, all the thing about is flushing and sealing in the guide. And like, they're not even, I might look at the waveform, you're like, matriculized. I don't care if you have saline in your guide, okay? So, or a contrast. Um, it's not going to affect the mean pressures. It'll affect the how well you see the how, the, the dichrotic notch and these other things. But I don't think it's the end of the world. Like I do contrast FFR all the time. I don't flush afterwards, right? I mean, so what do you think about? Um, and, and Bill Fryer will say that flushing the guide is not that critical. That you can do it with contrast. Well, I, I totally agree. I think you. It, it doesn't make a difference most of the time, but you know, I mean, just test it out in this slide here. This is just me injecting with an assist ejector, right? Here's the red. I'm injecting with assist contrast into my catheter. And so, yeah, it's damp for sure. But you also see that the mean has decreased just a little bit, but a little bit, it, it's there. So, I mean, that's that's the proof is in the pudding, right? So if it does it matter, probably not a whole lot, but in those borderline cases, it's enough. So just try that was this a out. contrast hyperemia there. <laughs> Um, well, I, yeah, I, get, look, your yeah, I yeah. get your point. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks again. Thanks, Harold. Again, that was phenomenal. And I guess in the, since we're getting close to the end, we'll have last but not least the Dr. Ivan Slovsin from for St. Francis Hospital. Again, finish up with some of the um, uh, imaging cases. Also, he has a lot of experience with intravascular imaging, OCT, and uh, various um, um, atherectomy devices and also the calcification. So, looking forward to seeing your cases, Ivan. Thank you so much again. Great, thanks so much. So over the next five, 10 minutes, we'll walk through intravascular imaging step-by-step step, just to reinforce some of uh, the points that we discussed today. So the first thing on any baseline intravascular imaging, whether it's IVIS or OCT, as Matt was showing with the MLD max algorithm, you want to assess plaque morphology because that's going to be what really guides what your treatment strategy is for the procedure. And specifically what you're looking for is the assessment of severe calcification, because that's gonna be what requires adjunctive therapies. But in addition to assessing for severe calcium, you wanna look at morphology throughout the entire lesion length. You wanna assess where your landing zones are gonna be, what your distal reference is, what your proximal reference is, and you try to find the, the best uh, landing zone for your stent. So here you can see just a side-by-side -side comparison that um, despite the high resolution with OCT, it's not just with OCT that you can do this. This can be done with either IVIS and OCT. On the first panel, you have a normal artery segment. This is always going to be your best landing zone. You want to look for a normal segment where you visualize the media. Here it's black in the IVIS screen. In OCT, it's the same thing. It's a dark rubber band that surrounds that vessel. Um, you have your catheter and both the IVIS, the OCT, guide wire, and the guide wire artifact. So you can see the side-by-side -side comparison. This is always going to be your best landing zone. 
In the second panel, we have lipid. You want to avoid lipid as a landing zone because it's going to be prone. Um, in the presence of thin cap fiber atheroma, it's going to be prone to dissection, distal edge dissections. Um, in the next panel is an example representative image of a fibrous plaque. These are your best next um, landing zones. If you can't find any healthy normal segment, as is often the case in complex patients, a fibrotic plaque is a reasonable landing zone. And then all the way on the right is severe calcium. And this is obviously what you're looking for when you're assessing whether or not you're going to need adjunctive tools. Angiographically, your trained severe calcium, just the presence of radio opacities on both sides of the lumen wall. With intravascular imaging, you realize that's an inadequate definition because you don't really know what their uh, calcium burden is and what their morphology of calcium is, whether or not it's calcified nodule or it's um, truly severe calcification by intravascular imaging that would be associated with stent under expansion. So for calcium assessment, we have the um, OCT calcium score. There's also an IVIS calcium score. They're both very similar, but with some minor differences. With OCT, you can assess the thickness. It's one of the advantages of OCT. So anything, if it's more than 0.5 millimeters thick, you're going to have a difficult time cracking and fracturing, achieving that calcium fracture that you saw with that prior shockwave case. Um, in OCT, you're also looking for arc that exceeds greater than half of the cross-section, calcified nodules, or a length greater than five millimeters. In IVIS, it's the same, essentially the same thing, but because you can't tell the calcium thickness, uh, Dr. Mahara and colleagues uh, came up with this IVIS score, where if you look for calcium reverberations, you can use that as a surrogate marker. So once you've assessed your plaque morphology, you've come up with your strategy whether or not you need to do any lesion preparation um, modality, whether that's with atherectomy or lithotripsy where that's available. After you've determined that, the next thing you're going to do is choose your stent size. And it's nine o'clock. Very um, simple. The, the first thing you want to do is just select your stent diameter. So you measure the reference at both the proximal and distal reference. For your stent sizing, we use the distal reference. Um, and whether or not you use an EEL vessel-based stent sizing approach or a lumen-based depends on if you can visualize the EEL. If you can visualize the EEL, you simply round down. Where with lumen-based, you round up. And then you measure the difference between the proximal and distal reference to come up with your stent length. As you see here, with these representative images, you can do it with both OCT and IVIS. With IVIS, the one caveat, you need to use the automated pullbacks in order to be able to measure um, accurate length assessments with the intravascular ultrasound systems. And at this point, you've completed your baseline um, intravascular imaging. So it's essentially three steps. You've done a comprehensive intravascular imaging analysis. Now, after stent implantation, Here's our stepwise approach to make sure that you're able to optimize your results. And this is really where you're going to get your benefit in uh, reducing stent-related events long-term. So the first thing after you implant your stent, you want to do your post-dilatation, high-pressure non-compliant balloons. Once you feel angiographic, you've had a good result, you repeat the intravascular imaging run. And the things that you're looking for, most importantly, is the MSA Achieving adequate minimum stent area and adequate stent expansion is going to really be what drives the best long-term results. We consider greater than 80% stent expansion to be acceptable. If it exceeds 90%, that's optimal, and we know that's associated with better outcomes from the ultimate trial and other studies. You also want to ensure that there's no distal edge dissection, and you want to make sure there's no geographic miss with um, significant disease at either of the reference segments. And once you've achieved all these endpoints and made sure you met all these endpoints, you know you've reached an adequate result. And here's just an example with both OCT and IVIS of what you're looking for for post-PCI assessment, which might lead to further optimization being required. So in the panel on the left, you see stent under severe stent under expansion. The intravascular ultrasound, you see there's 
barely a lumen. The IBIS catheter is taking up almost the entire lumen. Severe underexpansion. Same thing we see here with OCT. Stent malapposition is an example of how far the stent struts are from the wall on IBIS. And very clear, the OCT software has automated stent malapposition detection. And then lastly, this example here is of an edge dissection. The resolution on the OCT makes that, fl that dissection flat much easier to appreciate, but it's still readily available on IBIS. Someone uh, had asked in the chat you know, about dissection detection. Just with because you um, appreciate there's a dissection doesn't mean it needs to be treated. We typically treat if it's an intramural hematoma or if it's a significant edge dissection where it's greater than one arc of one quadrant. If dissection is greater than one quadrant for at least three millimeters, particularly at the distal edge, it's going to be more prone to potentially propagating. And that's something you'd want to consider treating. Each of these um, post-PCI complications, if you will, um, are treated differently. And the intravascular imaging guides how you treat it. If you have stent under expansion, you need to do high pressure non-compliant balloons. Sometimes you'll end up needing adjunctive therapy if that is insufficient, such as laser. Um, with stent malapposition, there's nothing behind, as you see in this OCT example, there's nothing behind the stent struts, it's just blood. So even a compliant balloon at low pressure that's appropriately sized is gonna allow that um, to become well opposed. Malapposition on its own is not associated with any significantly worse outcomes. It's just a matter of you wanna have it up against the wall so that equipment doesn't get behind this in any future procedures. And of course, so the drug um, can be adherent to the lumen and it's more likely the stent struts will endothelialize. And then lastly, with dissections, you wanna treat significant dissections with an additional stent. So just in the interest of time, that's overview of the step-by-step -step on how to use intravascular ultrasound and OCT. What's important, if you follow those simple steps, that you incorporate this into routine practice, because we know MACE accumulates at a rate of greater than 2% per year using contemporary drug eluting stents in stable ischemic disease, so a pretty significant number. We know that intravascular imaging from the light lab data leads to change in physician management in nearly 90% of cases. So almost every single case that leads to a change in decision making. And then lastly, from Ultimate and other trials, we know that intravascular imaging is associated with nearly 50% reduction in target vessel failure. So I feel this, this isn't just for the complex cases. This is important to become part of your routine practice. And with practice, it can uh, become pretty straightforward to utilize as well. Great. Hey, thank you so much again, Ivan. That was uh, a great presentation and a lot of things to cover in a little period of time, but a broad comprehensive, I think, complements nicely the case that uh, Matthew showed earlier on. But again, lots of learning tonight. We're a few minutes past the hour, but a lot of good points about how to optimally use uh, uh, OCT, IVUS, and coronary physiology for optimizing the cases. And before we leave, I'll let everyone give uh, any final thoughts before we cut out. So maybe, Chadi. You, you want to say your final word of no, wisdom learned, for the I learned audience? A lot. I learned from uh, Arnold about the caffeine. This is the first time I need to ask the patient now <laughs> before you put on the table, how long you've been MPO and when was the last cup of coffee? Wonderful, Arnold. Oh, no, great discussion and great to, to see you all in great cases. Thank you so much for showing us the future, Matt. Wonderful, Matthew. Well, I'm really uh, mad at Arnold because he convinced me to do IV adenosine and now he's telling me I got to do IC. So. <laughs> I, did, I said no such thing. <laughs> that, was the, that was the old guys. No, yeah, that's all right. That, you're right. It was. Um, I just always learned so much, Mano. So thank you for doing this. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and, and, and also, Evan, a really great presentation. I think often, and Evan will attest to this, that the time it takes to walk through the slide about how to size the stent is longer than it actually takes to do it live. And so, <laughs> uh, so it's um, just get out there, whether it's, I just think whether it's IVIS or OCT and, or, and also with FFR, whether it's 
resting or, or non-hyperemic or hyperemic is just getting more information is so important. We really want to maximize outcomes in our patients. So just embrace these technologies and let's maximize the safety and efficacy of, of our stents in our patients. So that's my preaching at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And then Ivan, the, you have the last word. Yeah, I agree. It's all it comes down to just improving outcomes for your patients. And as someone uh, asked in the chat, I'm just seeing about can Volcano assess EL? It can. And you know, no matter what intravascular imaging equipment you have in your cath lab or physiology, it's about using it, making it routine as part of your standard of care. And that's the best thing that we can do for our patients. Wonderful. So again, thank you all very much for excellent presentations and discussion tonight. Thanks all the audience for participating. Uh, thank our sponsors once again, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and Philips. And remind you that there's CME available. So for those of you who can get CME, just go to CV Innovations. You can download the forms. So thank you again so much and have a wonderful night. Thank you.